Okay, so the proverbial dice have been rolled, and the pun words for this video are hard and soft. I, I'm... No, sorry, I can't, I, no, just not this. So one thing that is known about polytheists, and especially heathens, is that we always get along, just kidding, that's just, that's not true at all. In fact, much of heathen discourse can be boiled down to two major themes. One, you're doing it wrong. And two, you can't tell me what to do. That being said, there is a disagreement between polytheists that can get fairly contentious, and that is over hard polytheism or soft polytheism. And part of the frustrating part of this discourse is that people will mean different things by these two labels. So what I want to do is go through hard polytheism and soft polytheism, what I think they are, what their entailments are, and where I stand on the issue and why. Let's start with hard polytheism. Hard polytheism is, basically, that the gods are distinct from one another as agents. This would mean that when one is talking about, say, the Norse god Odin and the Roman god Mercury, which are often seen as cognates between two cultures, that these deities are different and distinct. A hard polytheist recognizes that these are two deities from different cultures, with different names, with different attributes, different stories, and are therefore different deities. A soft polytheist will fall into one of two categories, atheistic and theistic. And I'm not going to discuss the atheistic one in detail today, but I will mention it briefly. The atheistic version of soft polytheism is that the deities do not exist as external agents, but only exist metaphorically as archetypes within human storytelling. This would fall into a category of atheopaganism, and due to it not being theistic, I don't think that it's useful to refer to this as polytheism because it's because it's it's not theism. Uh, why use the word polytheism to describe a belief that does not involve the gods in a theistic sense? The atheistic aspect of this form of polytheism makes it something other than polytheism. This results in a very different understanding of the hard versus soft distinction. The distinction here would be in terms of the gods as external agents versus not external agents. Hard polytheists would hold that the gods are external agents. Soft polytheists would hold that they are not external agents. And this is part of the problem in the discourse here because there are two separate conversations being had that often get conflated or even combined into the same conversation. And this particular aspect would be the atheism versus theism conversation. A more useful way of discussing this through terminology would be to say that one has an atheistic tradition of seeing the stories around the gods as referencing archetypes or something other than external agents, as contrasted with a theistic tradition of seeing the gods as external agents. The disagreement here is simply whether or not the gods are a product of the human mind or external to the human mind, which is not a disagreement among polytheists. It's a disagreement between atheists and polytheists. It would be more honest to call this atheistic paganism versus theistic paganism, which is an interesting discussion, but this video is about the theistic disagreement between polytheists. So, the theistic version of soft polytheism, as contrasted with hard polytheism that we discussed earlier, it's largely a blending of the gods from different cultures and framing them as the gods as presented to different cultures. For example, a soft polytheist might say that Thor and Shango are a single thunder god as presented to two different cultures, and what we see when worshipping this deity is how those cultures interpreted the thunder god. Uh, this same soft polytheist might roll together Thor, Jupiter, Zeus, and Shango with this same justification. They are all gods associated with thunder, therefore they are all the same thunder deity understood differently as expressed by different cultures. A problem results here, uh, which is that there isn't a clear justification when to combine or not combine deities. If all that's needed are similar associations or character, then one could combine any set of deities, 
into a single deity by weighting the similarities over the differences in order to combine them. And it's true that we see completely different standards among soft polytheists on when to combine or not combine deities. And not only that, but you have people saying that this is the correct way to do polytheism. A major problem with this approach is that it often results in what's called perennialism and can reduce polytheism into a oneness theology that isn't recognizably polytheism anymore. And unbridled, it combines every deity into a single deity, and here we are at monotheism. But we'll get more into that later. Another issue that arises is when one of these deities is seen as the true deity, and the others are the manifestations of this deity. So, for example, in the uh, Thor-Shango comparison, I've seen it put before that Shango is how the Yoruba saw Thor, ignoring the vast differences between the two, which positions Thor as the real deity and Shango as the imitation, which is simply a colonialist approach to spirituality, regardless of intention. The problem with both of these effects is relabeling. It winds up becoming an approach of taking deities that others believe in as distinct deities from other traditions and relabeling them into your personal understanding of them. And relabeling takes many forms. Christians, for example, might relabel deities from polytheist traditions as demons. Some atheists will relabel these deities as the brain doing stuff. And a soft polytheist may look at marginalized traditions and say that their beliefs are actually discussing their own deities, or their own perennialist simplification, like energy or something. These are all equally shitty. So, since we've discussed some of the issues with soft polytheism, what are some of the issues with hard polytheism? Now, take it into consideration that I've often identified as a hard polytheist, so my bias is noted here, but let me steel man one of the problems that can result from taking hard polytheism into a kind of absurdity. There are some points in history in which we can recognize that despite a difference in the name of a deity and elements of a deity's character within different traditions, that it's likely that these peoples were referring to the same agent. It's likely, for example, that the stories of Odin and the stories of Woden are referencing the same agent ontologically, even though the traditions around them and the discussions of their character have numerous distinctions. However, some hard polytheists may insist that Odin and Woden are in fact different agents, and there's definitely a justifiable way of going about this and defending this. However, it is fairly reasonable for a heathen to look at the stories of Woden or Godin in order to learn about the history of Odin's worship. After all, if the gods are real, then we might conclude that they have always existed, and these stories about them would be passed on from culture to culture with little changes here and there, being written down one way in one culture, another way in this culture. And at times, the similarities, along with the clear lineage of storytelling, can give us a picture that we're referring to something that we can reasonably justify as the same deity. And this gives a justification to a form of soft polytheism even within hard polytheism, and this is the source of a lot of disagreement between self-identified hard polytheists. There's a story in the Historia Langobardorum of Frey and Godin that tells of how the Langobards got their name, later known as the Lombards. Now, I'd hold that when I'm reading this text, it gives me an image of the history of the stories relating to Odin and Frigg, or possibly Freya, or a deity that originated some of the stories of both Frigg and Freya, now, for some, the differences and distinctions between Godin and Odin are such that we should view them as separate gods, and there's valid concerns here. Further, there are concerns around Frey, Frigg, and Freya. Which Norse deity is to be related to Frey? Or is she a separate agent entirely? Within a polytheist framework, did this deity split? Is, is that a thing that can happen? Wait, when else... Did this happen? This is another one of those little puzzles that uh, both pagans and historians get to be infuriated by for centuries into the future. But this brings us to an interesting conundrum. The various heathen faiths in history are so various because there was never any attempt at canonization like there was with Christianity. 
So these differences would appear in geographic differences that are within miles of each other, or even time frames easily over the course of centuries, if not decades, within the same location. Is the Njorthar, worshipped in early Scandinavian history, a different deity from the Njorthar worshipped later as his role in the religion changes? Probably not. But let's take it there, because if we're going to say that any distinction is a sufficient distinction, then this means that there are as many deities as there are tellings of them, which becomes more and more ontologically absurd the more you apply it. And then it gets lost as to which tools that we might use to understand the very concept of deity. You might start discussing them in groups. And then all of a sudden you have a hard polytheist defending the gods as archetypes. It should be noted that this isn't how hard polytheists see the gods, nor does it seem to be akin to any historical understanding that we know of. However, this is the result of applying the rule that any distinction is a sufficient distinction, which means that being a hardliner on hard polytheism is probably too far. So, since we're exploring the extremes of hard polytheism, what about the extremes of soft polytheism? There's two that I want to discuss in a little bit more detail, and that is perennialism and duotheism. Now, perennialism is the idea that all religions have truth to them and is largely an attempt to homogenize all religions into a single objective truth, though what that truth is seems to vary between perennialists. Now, while I might agree that there is a fact of the matter of reality, I don't think that perennialism is a good approach because... More often than not, it just suffices as an excuse to engage in the erasure of other traditions in favor of personal bias. For example, a major manifestation of perennialism is looking at all religion through a pantheist lens, which relabels traditions as monotheism. Now, this, this simply erases the distinction of the gods and holds that none of these distinctions matter. This has long been a strategy of erasure of polytheism just to replace it with monotheism without further discussion and is largely dependent on the oversimplification of religious narratives combined with the fact that people are generally ignorant of how massively diverse religious expression actually is across history. An approach that will stop just short of relabeling as monotheism is duotheism. Duotheism is the concept that there are only two deities. Often they are labeled as the divine masculine and the divine feminine. And all deities are different aspects or manifestations of these two deities. Now, personally, I think this is a bad approach because the gender binary is just an arbitrary foundation for theology. There isn't necessarily a reason for that in particular to be the starting place of a theological approach. And further, it doesn't even work as a foundation for theology. Many deities, both feminine and masculine, have contradictory aspects such that it doesn't seem to follow that they would actually be the same deity. Now, some of this seems to be based on an unjustified historical interpretation within the first part of the 20th century, in which the prevailing academic orthodoxy at the time was that there was an ancient monotheistic earth mother of sorts worshipped by ancient Neoliths. Whether or not the ancient Neoliths actually did worship such a deity is an open question, but the particular interpretation from the 20th century, however, was brought down in the academia of the 1960s as unjustified and rife with assumptions. But the belief did endure into contemporary pagan movements. It's certainly understandable that this would be an attractive concept, especially as a reaction to the masculine divine within Christianity that is lacking in any sort of feminine counterpart. Curiously, this monotheistic incarnation of a Neolithic Earth Mother has had a variety of political affiliations or framings within academia, starting out as an image of like this Victorian conservative matriarch of a time when everyone knew their place. And then again, as a feminist steward of nature and fertility, which is an image that endures today. Another curious association, however, is this image has shown up in like turfy forms of paganism that manifest pretty much as spiritual transphobia. Further, the foundational focus on a masculine and feminine divine tries to separate all the gods into two categories in which many of the deities might fit into, 
But ignoring all of the exceptions, Loki, as a gender-fluid deity, has aspects of femininity and masculinity, and they're not the only example. Odin exhibits gender-bending. Freya demonstrates characteristics that some might consider masculine, as does Skathi. And this is just within the Norse pantheon. Examples like this exist all over the world, and if you take an approach that recognizes all the exceptions and nuances to expressions of femininity and masculinity, especially when you're inclusive of non-binary approaches to gender within mythology, suddenly there's no longer a need to oversimplify the gods into two deities. Now, there are concepts of a sort of mother and father deity that often get referred to as the divine masculine and divine feminine, which have begotten creation and or all other deities, which could be a way to see this Neolithic Earth Mother with a possible masculine counterpart. But this would not be a monotheistic or duotheistic worldview. This would just be polytheism, as these two gods exist in addition to other gods, not as other gods, which is what reduces the view to duotheism based on notions of a gender binary. This position doesn't require viewing all feminine deities as aspects of the divine feminine or all masculine deities as aspects of a divine masculine. And it doesn't have the problem of this inability to account for exceptions. The gods, regardless of gender, would be descended from these two grounding deities in some way. So, what is an approach that doesn't have a lot of these issues? Well, we can certainly conclude that there likely is a fact of the matter, even if that fact of the matter is a monotheistic or atheistic one. But the cold hard truth is that the fact of the matter regarding the gods is inaccessible. And the frustration of this inaccessibility has been written about by philosophers constantly from the ancient world all the way up until today. The fact that these answers that would settle these controversies are inaccessible is the reason why these debates continue today. My personal approach, given that inaccessibility, has been one of recognizing deities as distinct as a matter of respect, even if I might personally disagree. Now, in the case of the Odin, Woden, Godin example that I mentioned earlier, I may approach my own spirituality in a way that validates learning of this mysterious deity through multiple sources across traditions. However, Others may hold to a tradition that is more strictly Anglo-Saxon, for example. And from the Anglo-Saxon tradition, one might prefer Anglo-Saxon sources in reconstructing that tradition. This would mean that regardless of the fact of the matter of whether or not the stories of Woden and Odin reference the same deity, the Norse tradition of Odin and the Anglo-Saxon tradition of Woden are absolutely distinct as they describe distinct characteristics. Recognizing that distinctness of tradition, rather than trying to override it with whatever my opinion might be, is valuable and promotes a more pluralistic environment where people can share and exchange ideas without engaging in relabeling. For example, if we assume that the tradition of Woden and the tradition of Odin refer to the same deity, one of those inaccessible truths would be which tradition is more accurate to the fact of the matter of this deity's character. So in light of that, one is perfectly justified in pursuing a tradition that focuses on the Norse image of Odin, the Anglo-Saxon image of Woden, or a tradition that views these sources as part of a greater puzzle about this deity. So, hard polytheism or soft polytheism? I find myself in a place that sits between them to an extent, but leans towards hard polytheism. I think that both positions have extremes that people might grandstand on, but can result in absurd consequences. But overall, there should be a focus on an approach that doesn't unreasonably override people, especially based on information to which no one has access. But those are my thoughts. What about yours? This is a massively complicated subject, and I'm sure that I completely messed up somewhere, but let me know where you sit on this matter. As I said, the truth of the matter is inaccessible, and my approach is but one of many in this case. And with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. And I should inform you that the like button, the subscribe button, and the bell have all been combined into a single overarching algorithm god. You are welcome to engage in this deity's many aspects. And remember to find a way or make one.